So to that end, I'd like to introduce the panel up to the stage. Um, so we've got Paul Linebury from uh, Farminco. Um, we've got Rob Derries from Goldfields. Um, Kevin from Deso. And uh, Rob Solomon from uh, School of Mines. Um, so just, um, I won't introduce everyone, I'll get them to introduce themselves individually and maybe just kind of talk about um, what role you have and the company you come from and maybe just a couple of minutes on, on what you're doing and then we'll kind of run into the, the panel questions. So uh, Rob, I'll start with you. Um, Rob Solomon, I'm a Professor of Practice at Wasden Kabuli uh, in Mining Automation and Data Analysis. I've been there for about two years. Prior to that, I've spent about not too many years, 30 or 40 years in, in mining and basically applying analytical techniques from every bit of mining from um, geophysics all the way through to tug operations in marine at Port Hedland to try and get the iron ore out. So, um, yeah, lots of experience in, in industry and now having retired from Fortescue 12 months ago, um, now being able to put a little bit back more into the industry. Cheers, Kevin West. I'm a client executive from Dassault. Uh, Dassault System is a French company. The T doesn't get pronounced. <laughs> um, so what we do is uh, basically looking at all sorts of aspects uh, with regards to CAD sort of designs of uh, what products facilities may be, and then the life cycle through that. So a lot around the simulation. Um, Predominantly out of aviation, um, motor vehicles, uh, defence, uh, logistics. Um, so yeah, it's a very broad product suite that we play in. Uh, Rob Terry, manager of innovation technology for Goldfields Australian Region. Um, I head up our modernisation innovation technology strategy for our four sites here in Western Australia. Um, our four key pillars of our strategy are. Um, decarbonisation, um, digitisation, utilisation, which is sort of asset optimisation, and support one. <laughs> <laughs> Where's James Curdy? <laughs> What's my strategy? Um, there's another one, but I've forgotten the other three that I've just mentioned. Sorry? Yes, uh, so digitisation. Um, decarbonisation, utilisation, thanks Rob, and <laughs> anyway, we won't worry about that. Um, and so, yeah, decarbonisation is a big one for us. Uh, there's a lot of work that we're doing in our renewable power generation, um, but mobile um, and decarb decarbonised material movements are a really important aspect for us as well. Um, Paul Linnery, so I work for Parenti Contract Mining Services in a um, newly created role as the manager of electrification. Um, prior to that, uh, operational mining background uh, with a few years of business development um, and, and really got into the sustainability and electrification stuff uh, as part of the EMC. Um, and now uh, managing the trials that Parenti Contract Mining is, is running, plus also the forward looking strategy for electrification. Remember the fourth one, safety, which is very important. <laughs> and I should probably just also mention, so my background is automation and robotics um, for over 25 years now in manufacturing, um, engineering, and then probably the last 15 or so years in mining. Uh, the problem is we've got two of these and we have to keep using them because tonight's um, uh, panel will actually be recorded and will go up on our YouTube channel so that anyone that can kind of attend tonight, you can hopefully share that, that with others. Um, so I'll, I'll get into the questions now. And um, it's, we've got a diverse mix of people and we've got a diverse set of questions. But um, maybe just to kick things off, um, I'll head over to, to Rob. Maybe you can answer first and then head to Paul. But I really wanted you to talk a little bit about the targets you've set in your companies and really what the current approaches within your company is to deliver um, on 
those, so I, I guess decarbonisation targets is, is what I mean there. Um, and when I think about the, the current approach, maybe talk a little bit about how you do that, not just within your company, but also with your partners and suppliers and, and contractors. Sure, thanks Michelle. Um, so like most mining companies currently, um, Goldfield has set the target to reduce our carbon emissions by 30% by 2030 and net zero by 2050. There's a huge amount of work that we're doing, as I mentioned before, um, in the renewable power generation space. Um, we've currently got, um, I'm sure a lot of people know about our Agnew uh, hybrid power station, which is running at about 54, 56% renewables currently. Now, on an average, um, we've got Granny Smith, which is running at 10% renewables currently. Um, our joint venture group is 10%. We've got some plans for St. Ives in the future. With all the work that we're doing um, in the power generation space and renewable power generation space, we still need to reduce 15 million litres of diesel out of our business to achieve our 2030 targets. So we're looking, um, as, as I said, we're doing a huge amount of work in the power space and with um, mobile equipment, um, we're looking to see how we can decarb that and decarb our material movement. Uh, so we're going through currently mapping out all of our um, material movement strategies for all of our sites and working with our partners to understand how we're going to achieve 17 or 15 million litres of diesel by reduced 15 million litres of diesel by 2030. Um, so yeah, we're working with our partners like Minko and other contractors and also our overland uh, haulage contractors as well, as well as our um, internal Goldfield fleet. Well, thank you. And um, maybe, Paul, if you can answer, I guess, as a mining services provider, how do you work with client strategies in your approach? Yeah, so I think with, with Brandy, not, not to, uh, we, we've committed in FY23 to make commitments. Um, it sounds it's possibly a little bit late, but um, we're, we're, we've got a bit of work to do as a contract miner. Um, so yeah, those will ideally come out next year. But in saying that, um, we have really, I guess, identified and, and really noticed all of our clients and, and their commitments. So uh, Goldfield, for instance, RGO, Anglo, all of our clients, um, it, it's a little bit, I don't want to say trickier for a contract miner, but all of our clients are different and have different commitments and different timelines and different responsibilities. Um, all of them do seem to want to decarbonize their minds in, in some fashion, um, but they're going about it differently with, with different priorities. So as a contract miner, we need to recognize that and, and cater to our clients. And if that means sort of working more with the people that are uh, sort of, it's, it's kind of working more with the people that are more committed, I guess, at, at the current time, um, which, which is the, the path that we're going to take rather than uh, making, I would say, sort of blanket statements about where we're actually uh, going to reduce, because for us, it, it really does, um, it really does need our, our clients to be committed for us to then commit as well. Um, so that's sort of how we're, we're thinking about it, rather than um, saying we need to reduce scope one and scope two, um, because for the contract mining uh, world, that's actually uh, non-existent. Um, most of the houses is also three because it all exists with the mine owners. So we've got a bit of a different challenge. All right, thank you. And I guess everyone's at a different stage on the decarb journey, so you really have to kind of tailor what you do. So it's just great. And, and we operate in North America, in Africa, and in Australia for clients of varying scale and maturity. So it's, it's fun, but challenging. All right. Um, before we get into a bit more detail around um, yeah, your current progress and what you're doing, we might just maybe handing over to um, Kevin and Rob a little bit. And maybe Kevin, if you can talk a little bit about how um, I guess you help with enablement to, to mining companies to, to look at um, simulation um, alternate methods of kind of learning and design with um, artificial intelligence to, to inform. How could we do something differently with, with the tool set that you have? I suppose the way that we view it, <clears throat> one of the primary tools that gets used is sort of a, a model-based systems engineering approach. Um, so traditionally, we, a lot of the emphasis is looking at the, the, apart from the power generation side, the other side, the biggest diesel consumers is going to be the, the vehicles. Um, so 
it's looking at that, the model of the vehicle um, and breaking that down into three parts. So there's the actual asset itself, there's the power source, so moving from diesel to, to battery. The third obstacle is the actual course that that vehicle needs to needs to move through. Um, so part of that decarbonisation journey is trying to replicate that in a virtual environment to help speed up and learn how to, to maximise the transition that needs to occur. So if you look at mining as a whole, it's, it's 100, 100 to 120 years of moving away from horsepower and people power towards uh, alternative fuels, which were predominantly diesel and things like that. And we're looking at the targets that the guys are talking about now, where all of a sudden we've got 20, 30 and, and just beyond. So how do we accelerate that 100 years worth of learning and experience into eight years? Because realistically, that's what we're trying to achieve. And the reality is, is that we try and do that physically, and we go through various assets and things like that, we don't have the time. We need to learn and we need to improve on a far quicker basis. The only way that we can achieve that is through simulation. Um, so where those come from, uh, from an industry perspective, is looking at things like Tesla. So Tesla came up with the idea of having an electric battery to just put into a car. They went to Mercedes, they went to BMW, they went to everywhere else in town, and everybody went, who's going to buy an electric car? The reality is, if you have a choice next year, sorry, Tracy, but if you had a choice of what car you were going to buy, <laughs> would Tesla be on your list? <laughs> But it, that's the way, and that's the dynamics of how things are changing. And it also, Tesla hadn't built a vehicle 12 years ago. So they had to compete with the likes of Mercedes, a BMW, to that level of quality. And so they come at it from a completely different approach, but they hit the, the standards from a safety perspective, from a, 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 I suppose, a customer satisfaction perspective and things like that. That's all been achieved, not by building hundreds of cars and crashing it, that's by build, going through the process of testing, analyzing, doing all the, the um, simulation behind that before that asset is actually built. Um, and that's the tools that, that DeSoto predominantly plays in. It's one of the areas that we're playing. The other area, if we look at the three analogies again, is the, uh, the mining courses. So we've got products like Surpec, uh, Geovia, which is the brand around the, the mining engineering piece. So we, we sit in a unique aspect where we cover a lot of those areas through our various product chains and our heritage. And it's how do we combine those together to try and speed up this process. Thank you, thank you. And it's a, a pretty complex set of decisions that we're now faced with within our minds. Maybe before I ask you, Rob, about what you're doing with students, did you want to add any comments just around, I guess, just your philosophy or thinking around simulation um, in this transition? Yeah, look, I, I think um, I've had a long experience with, with simulation and, and I think the question was asked before is how do you, you know, when you're simulating something that doesn't exist, how do you convince people that it, it's true? Well, the answer to that question is that it's probably not true, but it's probably the best answer that you've got. Um, and, and so without the simulation, you, you really don't know anything and you're just guessing. With the simulation, you will understand a lot more deeply the dynamics of the system that you're working with. I think the other challenge, and we, we were speaking about this beforehand, is that we, we, one level of simulation takes the physics of the vehicle and maybe even by some machine learning to, to the dynamics and stuff like that and produces a model that can be used to predict what, how that system will perform in the future. But the other thing is that there's just a huge amount of uncertainty where we are at the moment about you know what will these batteries actually be, how will they perform, how will they perform in an environment when that environment is climate changing even due to climate change. So there's a huge degree of uncertainty out there, which, which simulation in and of itself will not resolve. It will enable you to run multiple scenarios through a whole range of those uncertainties in the future and give you a great result. So I think simulation is the only way that we'll be able to go forward. Will it be 100% perfect? Probably not. But is it better than anything else that we've got? And the answer is yes. And the other thing in my experience um, with simulation modeling is that by, in the process of building the simulation model, you learn a lot more detail about the dynamics of the system that you're working with than if you didn't bother doing that simulation model. And even the process of developing the model is a learning opportunity for you. I think that's a good point. It really is, is a 
method for learning um, rather than necessarily having all the answers. So you just maybe, uh, and I don't know if you know the answer, but do you think that everyone is ready to use more uh, simulation tools rapidly, or, or do you think it is still relatively new in the in the industry? I mean, we do long simulations, but um, um, I, I can answer. Look, my response is that I've been doing simulation modeling and mining for for twenty years, <laughs> so it's it, it's not a, a new tool. Um, we, we build it, at least some of the larger mining houses have built simulation models of their supply chain and what happens in the pits. But I, I think now it's becoming more useful. And the other point is that the level of detail of the models that we're used to using in the industry is not adequate for where we need to go. We've got to go down towards that digital twin, the you know, uh, agent-based modeling solution that's distinct from the you know, uh, uh, simulation or physics-based models, straight physics-based models. So I, I think there's a, a way to go, but things like you know, the EMC picking a simulation as, as a key driver is an indication that the industry is is willing to go down that path. Oh, it's just very quick. I, um, I was in Brisbane in the last two days with uh, Land Forces, which is the, the basically the Army's annual convention that they have. Um, but it was interesting because we, I was at the, um, the, 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 the Bushmaster, which is um, Talis, also a French sister company, uh, that builds that for the uh, Australian Defence Force. But they've had a, it wasn't Talis that was directly involved, but one of the customers who owns the Bushmaster has actually tried it with a battery engine. So the lessons to be learned is not just identified within money, defence is going through exactly the same problems. They're asking exactly the same questions. So it's the same, how do we learn, how do we cross pollinate? Because all industries are going through this. The rail industry is going to be going through it. Um, anything that uses the transport shipping industry, and it's there's a common thread throughout all of them. So the reality is, is we've got the capability to learn lessons. And I know one of the things we had through the MC was a requirement, well, we wanted to do the simulation, but it needs to be open source. And the beauty of it is it, it's already open source because Tesla builds cars, Panasonic builds their batteries. It's two different companies. They need to have a common thread to connect together. And they have different, uh, their courses that they need to plot is North America, China, uh, Africa, whatever else that course may be. So how do they get those combinations right? That has to happen with an open format. Otherwise, you can't share and you can't learn. So the whole emphasis is to share information so everybody is learning and every industry is going forward. Thank you. I'm doing my hand that the other way. And it might get back to the um, on the ground. Um, and maybe um, Rob and Paul really came to hear a bit more about, um, you know, given the, order, the electrification journey that you guys are on and have been on for a little while now, if you could just give, I guess, just a bit more insight into what you're learning, a bit more of the progress on sites with whether it's vehicle trials or other aspects of electrification, I'd love to hear yeah, a little bit more detail around um, yeah, what, what you're doing and if you want to add to the simulation and, and how you're using it in that process, feel free to add or otherwise just talk about yeah, some of the progress and insights you have. Sure. Um, so we started this program back in 2019 and started working with the OEMs and, and other technology providers who were retrofitting uh, other equipment, existing equipment, and all of the work that we were doing, we found that everything was theoretical. So, and to Rob's point, I mean, you've got to start somewhere. And we, for us to hang our hat on it um, and to make a decision whether we go a full electric mine or whether we go down this journey of electrification or even a transition of moving into diesel electric and then from diesel electric, we could potentially move into battery electric once we've got some understanding and we understand the technical readiness level of that technology. We decided um, that we should actually take a punt at it and have a trial. So we partnered, went out to the OEMs and we partnered with Sandvik to get our hands on their first 50 ton battery electric underground truck, the Z50, so the artisan version, and their LH518 um, underground bogger, battery electric bogger. So we've taken possession of those. That's been a, a journey for the last sort of two and a half to three years. Uh, we've got them on site now at St. Ives Hamlet, which we're using as a bit of a test site. It's, it's a good size, 
to be testing this equipment. It's 550, 570 meters vertical. So it's not too taxing on the equipment and it's not too much of a disruption on production as well um, to, to the same items production profile. A bit of a disruption to the team, but it's not so much of a, a disruption on the big scheme of things. So we, um, yeah, so we're currently running those two bits of gear in, in production. Um, when we're moving that loader, currently we're just doing free bogging and truck loading the loader and then we'll move that into some development soon. It only went underground about a week ago, so we're just starting to capture information. The truck we've been running underground since May. Uh, it's been a, a, not so much a challenge, it's, it's doing everything that uh, our simulations told us it would do, so that's been a real positive for us. Um, it's a 50 tonne truck and we've got that in a cycle with 63 tonne trucks, so um, the engineers are a bit unhappy with the production that we're getting out of the truck. Um, but it's doing everything that it says on the can, which is, which is really good, and we're expecting the same, if not better, from the loader. Uh, we're also, we've partnered with 3ME and BME, um, so the same company that uh, provided the battery and drive system for the machine that Kevin was talking about, and we've retrofitted a Volvo L120 IT, and we actually started looking at that more on the DPM side rather than um, reducing our carbon emissions, because each machine you're looking at about 900 to 1,000 tonnes per annum with utilisation of that equipment, so it's not a huge factor. And it, it doesn't put a big dent in our carbon emission reductions, but we see a benefit with that with reduced diesel particulars, especially for service crew that are working underground um, in areas of fairly low ventilation. So that was our main driver for that. Yeah, exactly. And and with that machine, that's a good point, Paul. With that machine, it's got an onboard charger, so we plug it into a jumbo box and we charge it. Currently, we've made, with our risk assessment, we made a decision that all battery electric equipment on the goldfield site will be charged in the return airway, and that's really because we don't know what we don't know with this technology yet, so we've been quite conservative. Um, but the trials that we're doing so far um, are working really well, but we're only doing one truck, one loader, one IT, and we're also partnered with Murray Engineering for their ultra-fast charge retrofitted Toyota Land Cruiser. We've got that at Granny Smith, and that's actually working quite well. Very much proof of concept. Um, there's still work to be done, but we've got a lot of learnings from that, which which is beneficial for us. But like I said, there's only um, one of each of those. So we uh, we need to start to simulate from the data we're going to be capturing for those, and we're feeding that data into the uh, Mine Consortium data platform as well. And it's, so it's not just both fields that are getting these learnings and capturing this data, it's all the other members of the consortium who are trialling similar equipment in similar um, mining mining areas or in different mining methods as well. So it, it's really across the board. But we're going to be able to capture that data and then start to simulate that and work out the, the, what we need to do for the larger scale and to scale this. Because at the moment, like I said, it's very small numbers and it's easy for us to have uh, one charger, one machine, two batteries, it's quite simple. But when we start talking about eight boggers, 14 trucks, what does that mean? Um, and especially with the battery technology for the trucks at the moment, where I won't talk in too much detail about how many trips we're getting, but if we were to put that truck into a Granny Smith mine, we wouldn't get out of the portal on one battery swap. So for us, and Granny Smith's currently running 14 trucks, so for us to fully electrify a mine like Granny Smith, uh, the numbers don't stack up and it's just it's not economical so we need to look at other technologies um, like the blue vein or other trolley systems to see what we can do and then that's why i mentioned before about diesel electric potentially diesel electric will be a transition for us with our wood fleet um, we did some trials with diesel electric loader last year at the St. Ives Hamlet and got really good results from that and and 35 percent reduction in diesel burn so that was something that we can see we've, we've Done, done the actual physical trial, we've got the data from that, and then we can try and look at it, simulate what that's going to look like as we start rolling that out across our business. Probably enough words from me. A lot's happening. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Um, I, I probably before I dive into some of the trials, I'll just make a few comments. I think something that we've found um, in this trial phase is that um, we probably weren't uh, ready for uh, R&D and technology, and I'm not sure if the mining industry is. We, we kind of expect things to be bought and work, um, but but in the EMC and working with uh, OEMs and um, 
some of our suppliers. This stuff really is uh, new technology and um, either through COVID, which didn't help, but also just through the fact um, that, that it's brand new technology and, and hasn't been used before and is um, sort of cutting edge. You might say six months and then we're waiting 12 months later after that six months. Um, and that's sort of, uh, I don't want to say a given, but it was something that we probably weren't accustomed to originally. We, we, we were having conversations and, and that's possibly uh, delayed, I think, some of the, the learnings, which are really now starting to kick in. So Rob just mentioned all his trials. Um, we've got a, a number of really good trials and we probably started around the same time in, in that sort of 2019, 2020 range with um, with an LV, the, the Bortana, the Sagescape Bortana, and the, the Normet um, Charmec. So both of those were, were battery. Um, and some of the feedback we started getting, which was uh, on the Charmec, so that, that really encouraged us to continue to go. Um, the operators loved it. They could think, they could hear, they could breathe. Um, it went faster upgrade. Uh, they didn't. They they weren't late to uh, check out every time. Um, so all those sort of little things, and um, as much as you can convince operators to, to change, I think that's a, that's probably one of the biggest challenges with some of these electric vehicles is, is getting the the people that operate them to change habits or, or do something new or use something different. Um, and, and currently now, I think we've got about uh, four four trials. In, in different stages. So we're working with um, Zero Automotive. I'm not sure I call it, it's a trial, but we've purchased three uh, battery converted Land Cruisers. Um, we have purchased the Normet um, Charmec after that trial, which will, will just become fleet replacement essentially for us going forward. So those are sales. Um, we're working closely with some of our other OEM partners, McLean's here, and we're trialing a battery electric shock rig, which is the first shock rig that McLean's has bought to Australia, and we're, we're lucky to be trialling that at the site. Um, and, and even some of that stuff, there's, there's differences in the operation. Um, on the heavy vehicle side or ancillary side, we're, we're working with 3 me also, so the learnings that we both get um, from whoever gets the vehicles first, like I, I keep saying to other people, I don't want to make the same mistakes that someone else has made, so I always call up Rob because he gets it first, and then we, we try and not make those same mistakes, and then the next person that gets it, <laughs> not Rob specifically, no, but yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so I think the, some of the collaboration, I guess, that's been fostered even through, not necessarily directly in the EMC, but ancillary to the EMC, so just introductions between companies and people. Um, prior to this, I, I wouldn't have called Rob to say, how did, how did you get X, Y, Z across the line, and what, what sort of happened? Um, so I think that was pretty great. Um, and then uh, in, in the bigger heavy space, we, we've got a prototype for the 665, so they might um, look like that instead of the 50. Uh, but so even some of the challenges of that that you don't necessarily consider, so this is a, a full prototype, so there'll be NDAs and we'll, we'll, we'll try and be sharing what we can, but the, the operation of this machine, because it does go faster upgrade, and then mine we're using it at uh, Sunrise Dam has, I think, similar to Granny Smith, probably 12 trucks in the fleet, it catches up to every single truck when it when it loads. So you can't really test how fast it's going um, or all the efficiencies that can be gained from it. Um, I think in the mind like Sunrise, that's why we picked it, is there's multiple accesses, multiple declines, um, opportunities for to use it in different locations. Um, but some of that stuff, that, that simulation will help. Um, that, that people saying, well, maybe mixed fleets, these sort of things, like the, the mixed fleet aspect is going to be tricky. Um, if you're looking at haulage, so I think that's something to, to consider as well. Whereas the, a lot of our ancillary gear um, is, is kind of plug and play, we just need to put some more substations and some more jumbo boxes. So, so that stuff sort of fits and, and makes sense and is understandable um, from an operations background at least. Um, but yeah, it, it's going to be interesting when you, for, for a barminko, when you pull up to an underground and now there needs to be three jumbo boxes because you've got the the Jumbo, the spray neck, the IT, maybe a fast charger for your LVs, um, all at the workshop. Um, so yeah, the, the, the infrastructure, um, which is a big part of the 
can see is, is really coming to the front. We, we sort of realised early on that the infrastructure is obviously the, the linking piece. So without solving that, you, you can't really solve anything else. Well, there's um, a lot of work and a lot of great insights there. And I guess if everyone's wondering where all the electric vehicles are going, they've all been sucked up by these guys. Um, so, yeah, but great to be able to, yeah, it's not a lot that's available. But, yeah, great to be able to hear the insights and just really rapid learning um, between you. We've got one last question, and it's really about um, skills and capability. So maybe i just start with you, Paul, go down the line. Just maybe if you talk a little bit about the skills and capabilities you're starting to see will be needed, and then Rob can finish off and, and tell us about how you're starting to um, influence the degree at Wasdom um, to prepare for this transition. So. So I guess with, within Parenti, we're, we're a contract miner, so we, we, we bring the people, we bring the fleet, and we bring the skills to operate that fleet, um, is, is basically our, our service offering. Um, so we're, we're quite hands-on, and those hands-on skills, um, I think eventually the, the operators will change, but in the next two to eight years, we're still going to have truck drivers, we're still going to have loader operators, drillers. So, so those those people and their skill sets are still going to be the same. Um, I don't really want to touch on automation. That's a different panel, but that's probably coming as well. Um, but we're, we're really uh, cognizant of the, the the maintenance and then the, the infrastructure setup that's required to operate these mines. So, so what's the what's the split going to be between heavy diesel uh, fitters and auto sparkies and HV? Uh, almost HV mechanics rather than HV uh, sort of fitters. So um, that, that uh, hands-on sort of apprentice um, maintenance roles and then obviously running all this cabling, setting up all this infrastructure, maintaining all the infrastructure that's required, um, whether or not that sits with, with our clients or, or with ourselves, I think that that's going to be a, a significant uh, skills gap because I don't know if anyone employees out here has been trying to hire uh, electricians or auto sparkies or any of those sort of uh, people within the industry, but they can't, they don't exist. They're, they're like, I don't know, imaginary or what's the, you, you can't get them hands teeth. Um, but yeah, so so that, that challenge is, is going to come at us pretty quickly, especially even in the trial phase where, where we're trying to learn from a maintenance side, how do we maintain a 65 ton battery electric truck? What portion of its maintenance is electric, what portion is um, mechanical, because uh, we don't know the answer and, and neither does standing. So, or the other OEMs. I probably don't have a lot to add from what Paul's just said. Um, as part of the operational readiness portion of the trials that we've been doing and that we're running now, we, we sat down with the OEMs to understand and actually did a race with the OEMs to understand on a maintenance side. So the operator side doesn't really change. It's upskilling the operators so they can understand the technology, understand how to monitor, monitor the battery life, um, do some work on um, understanding safe safe operation, especially with the charging, loading and unloading. So all of our, I should mention, the, the truck and the loader that we've got are a battery swap. Uh, the in-situ charging doesn't make sense for us at the moment. Um, so we, we like the Sandvix um, approach to the battery swap, but there's a lot more that the operators need to do. They're not just pulling up to a browser and, and filling it up. So on the operator side, um, we don't have a bad handle on that. On the maintenance side, to Paul's point, it, it's really just involving, for the mobile equipment, it's involving trades like A-grade electricians that would normally be involved in mobile equipment. So normally you have fitters and auto sparkies. Now we're introducing A-grade electricians to be involved in maintenance, do their routine maintenance, and also be involved in repairs as well, and working alongside the auto electricians and, and the, the, the fitters. So that side of it, and as Paul said, it's hard to get a hold of those trades as well. So there's going to be a huge influx of requirement for those trades as we start scaling this equipment in our operations. Um, that's probably all I need to add. The other thing would be, no, no, you're right. It's happening in the surface space. And I haven't even mentioned the surface. We've been talking about underground, but we're also, we've got open pit mines here in WA as well, and we're part of the charge on challenge so we can try and understand what we can do to reduce uh, diesel burn in our open pit fleet as well, because that actually, they're larger trucks and they're burning a lot more diesel than our underground fleet. Although our fleet sizes aren't huge, uh, that's still some uh, an area that we need 
need to reduce our diesel burn and our carbon emissions. Um, the other thing we looked at uh, as part of our risk assessments was, was really just understanding what the risks are. And that's something that we've had to learn and try and work with the OEMs to, and also with um, North America and, and Canada, who've been doing battery electric for a lot longer than we have, trying to understand what they've learned, understand what risks have been involved with battery electric equipment underground uh, and in the, on the surface as well. So that's been a real learning for us in trying to, so getting our safety teams, um, occupational health and safety, all of our um, teams that are all involved in risk assessments to sort of think outside of what we currently know and what we've been doing for the last hundred odd years. Cool. So a widespread, and maybe just anything on the Sims capability that you see, if you kind of think upstairs in the office that you're saying would be needed more on on my side. People. <laughs> no, we've stuck with exactly the same problem. So to, to a discipline for simulation is a specialised engineering requirement. Um, traditionally, because Australia has never done manufacturing, we've never really invested in that part. We do have design and things like that, but typically it goes offshore to be built. So that skill set doesn't reside within Australia. So there's a there's a different need for us to start skilling up in that particular space. But there's also an identified need with, with what's happened with COVID, what's happened in China with regards to supply chain and things like that. That is going to have to come in here. So that's an area that is the, the government's really acknowledged that that's an area that we have to invest in. So we're looking to partner with the universities and things like that. We provide our software to the universities to, to do the training and everything else. This particular area of model-based systems engineering is, is, a, is a newer front, um, but it's a definitely a growing, rapidly growing area. So the more we can encourage people to, to look into that particular area, Obviously, the better it'll become. And and how are you uh, setting the students up? Okay. Um, well, where do I sign up for the simulation now? But uh, look, I'll, I'll, I'll narrow it down a little bit because it, it, this the challenges that we're facing are, are huge. Um, but what I suppose looking at it from Bosom Kalgoorlie's perspective initially, and then we'll talk a little bit about Bosom Meesey. Um, we we train mining engineers and metallurgists, and what what we really want to do is make sure that those mining engineers and metallurgists, when they come into the industry, are, are well versed in, in what's going on and the, the impact of of energy transition and sustainability and digital transformation is. So a couple of years ago, uh, there was the foresight review, uh, of the, which you're probably all fully aware of. We've gone through and we've implemented most of that, and, and my role was I think part of part of that transition. And so over the last few years, we've been embedding more and more uh, digital uh, skills in terms of how do we get data literate mining engineers and metallurgists. And, and the challenge there is. Um, some mining engineers and metallurgists will really get a passion for being data scientists, and we can have a hybrid who, who are data scientists um, and with mining engineering skills. But predominantly, we need to have the, our mining professionals who are really capable of being good clients of, of people that are doing that, those things for them, because it's a, a specialised skill. So I think um, we've been working down that process, and we've been involved with we've, we've got that embedded in the first year, second year, fourth year automation and new mining techniques. All of that's going pretty well. We're embedding uh, workshops into the work integrated learning weeks, which I'm sure you're aware of, which can have a digital um, bent to them. Uh, we're trying to uh, work on building a digital innovation lab out of Curtin. Uh, that, that has been talked about for a while. We're, we're still struggling to get that off the ground, but we're working with Innovation Central now and, and Cisco uh, to try and find some seed projects that, that we can set up out of Kalgoorlie that will get that digital innovation lab going. And I think um, Andrew here will, will be great um, to come and talk to me or Andrew about, about doing something there, lots of opportunities. Um, and then we're sort of heading down the path to digital, digital transformation, then probably 12 months or so, you know, sustainability really hit the headlines. Um, and it's, it's not just decarbonisation, but you know, traditional owners and, and a whole range of how do we make mining sustainable. And, and I think that's going to be another absolute shift in, in what we're doing. So we've, 
we're discussing now, we're halfway through the discussion, I think, with the academics out there about what it means you know, to, to the mining engineering student in their discipline. So you know, mine planning, mine design, things about mine design, how, how we build whole roads. Um, if we look at decarbonisation the same way as we look at safety, you know, do we really need to move that dirt? So even going back to how you how you really need to understand what's in the ore body to be able to mine very specifically to minimise the amount of material movement, um, how the, the trade-offs that mining engineers have done forever between conveying and haul networks and all that sort of stuff, that, that's all going to be open uh, up for grabs. What does that mean for the mining engineer? We're, we're busily talking about how we embed that into the university. The other, the other side, of course, is the metallurgical front because we can have as many skilled battery technicians, but if we don't have the metals to make the batteries, we're, we're going to get a little bit screwed. So, um, getting the, the in the metallurgy area, Andy um, is, is over there working on the Kalgoorlie Minerals Research Lab. We're trying to, to get some of the, the, the metallurgists focus on how we, we really improve the recovery and get the technology going for battery and critical minerals. So that's that's another big area for, for the school. Uh, one of the things that Sabine has been driving, and I think it's a really great idea, is that every every year during our work, the Working Great Integrated Learning Week will we'll have at least two sort of key um, sort of peak um, workshops, uh, one on sustainability and the other one on digital transformation. And, and that will engage senior leaders. We've already had one on sustainability, it went really well. We had a lot of the senior leaders coming in from both fields uh, and, and around. We had the students, we had the academics. And one of the things that we had at that meeting, which was absolutely fantastic, was, was just happens to a couple of high school students. And at the end of the day, they were just sort of gobsmacked that you know, the mining was really taking this seriously. So one of the things I'd like to embed formally in that is that we, we maybe some for some of the high schools um, invite some of the best and brightest um, STEM people in, into that workshop so that they can get a, a they can be a fly on the wall. So they're not just getting the spill on the television about telling us how wonderfully green minded industry is They're actually seeing the industry wrestle with the problems. Um, so that's something. And, and then there was a meaty thing. Um, there's just a whole range of, of areas around battery technology and hydrogen technology and mineral economics, how we approach the, the, the risks associated with the uncertainty in the future. So all of that now is very, very focused on, on sustainability. We're at the beginning of the journey and really appreciate uh, working with you guys on that. And I think, I think that was about all. I'll probably remember something else later, but that's enough. Probably. Thank you. Um, I was going to hand to questions, but I realise I've gone well over time here. So everyone is here to kind of follow up and um, I'm glad that food and drinks have continued to be um, supplied uh, while you've been standing for so long. Um, so yeah, I just really want to thank again everyone today, um, Rob and Kevin and Rob um, and Paul. Um, just some amazing work happening in industry. We really think you guys are leaders um, in what you're doing. And, and so, yeah, feel free to, to um, uh, hit them up for, for more questions and more, more information um, over the rest of the drinks. Um, but really also want to thank um, Kevin, you and Deso, um, for, again, for your support for, for um, tonight um, and supporting the, the School of Mines alumni and being able to run these, these kind of events for free um, so that we can continue these kind of discussions. Um, we were to have someone from Curtin tonight um, talk about uh, MBAs and the mineral economics. They weren't able to make it. So what we'll do is we'll send out an email. They're really um, keen to kind of encourage more people into to the university. They've got great programs in those areas. Um, so we'll send that information out so that you can follow up um, if you've got any other questions. Um, but yeah, this brings um, to an end um, the official proceedings with the, the panel, but we've got more drinks and, and food for, for people to enjoy. Um, so the strategy um, committee that runs these events, um, we've got Andrew and Ben, and I think that's all Dave here. So if anyone wants to, to run more events, please reach out to them. And I really want to thank uh, Liz for, for everything you've done to set up the, the yeah, and, and the team for, for setting up the AV and, and everything here tonight and working with all the sponsors. There's a lot of work that goes
goes into to getting this in place. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. Sorry, and thank you to Turbo for the drinks tonight as well.